My name is Cesar Garcia and I'm the founding director and chief curator of The Mistake Room. I want to first start off by thanking Mika and Davida and Night Gallery for hosting us. It's a, a busy week for us. We're getting ready to um, open our renovated space this Friday um, with a solo exhibition by Corcoran at Renato Chai. So I hope you guys can join us at 730. Um, but for those of you who don't know, The Mistake Room is a new uh, nonprofit uh, organization here in Los Angeles that is solely devoted to an international program of contemporary art. So the per when we decided to sort of open up the organization, we knew from the very beginning that while our exhibition program was going to focus on bringing artists who are living and working outside of the U.S. to produce and um, exhibit work here, that we also wanted to create different programs to support our local community of artists and expand their opportunities abroad. And that's what brings us here tonight. And I'm so happy to be sort of uh, inaugurating our International Curatorial Research Program with Hendrik Folkerts. And this new initiative, um, which we launched today, will bring three international curators to Los Angeles each year on short-term residencies. And during these residencies, the curators are going to be able to have professional meetings with colleagues, get acquainted with our sort of uh, the wide range of institutions that we have here. And also in working with our colleagues, they're going to be conducting studio visits um, with, with artists here in Los Angeles. So I see some artists here uh, in the audience who are going to be seeing Hendrik later in the week. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to do a brief introduction of Hendrik. Um, I'm really happy that he's here with us. We knew when we uh, started this new program that we wanted him to sort of be the first person we brought to Los Angeles. Hendrik is the curator of film, of performance, film, and discursive programs at the Stalig Museum in Amsterdam. And he's really a pioneer when it comes to um, really sort of thinking about how public programs can be integrated into the curatorial sort of fabric of institutions. And we often look to sort of Hendrik's work as a, as a sort of point of departure for the way we're attempting to structure uh, our programming outside of the confines of our space. And you'll hear more about that later on throughout this week. Um, so Hendrik has been at the Stylix since 2010, and he studied art history at the University of Amsterdam, specializing in contemporary art and theory, feminist practices, and curatorial practices. He curated the public program of the Temporary State Lick, a special interim um, program that was presented from August 2010 until October, 2012, uh, October 2011, and the Temporary State Lick 3, which was developed in close collaboration with partner institutions throughout Amsterdam and included different performances, small scale exhibitions, lectures, public interviews, symposia, screenings, music and book presentations. Following the opening of the museum's new building in September of 2012, Folkerts continued the performance, uh, film, and discursive program, working with artists such as Pablo Bronstein, Valerie Export, Dominique Gonzalez Forrester, Sharon Hayes and Brooke O'Hara, Matthew Lutz Kinoy, Emily Roysden, and Wu Sang, amongst many others. Hendrik is a frequent contributor to various publications, and he's the co editor of Shadow Files, Curatorial Education and of the forthcoming book, Facing Forward, Art and Theory from a Future Perspective. So please help me in welcoming Hendrik to Los Angeles. Wow. My, my, after such an introduction, <clears throat> what is one to say? Except uh, thank you very much, and um, thank you for making me part of your uh, international residency program. Being the first is an incredible honor, obviously, and I'm looking forward to a week full of meetings and studio visits and whatnot, and it's been incredibly welcoming. So thank you to the Mistake Room and Caesar and everyone working there, and of course for you to coming to my lecture, which uh, hopefully will be entertaining enough for you not to fall asleep in this a bit of a warm space, but we'll, we'll manage. So I'm going to talk a bit about the work that I've done through um, an analysis, I guess. For me, it was also a good opportunity to think, like, okay, what exactly has the work been in the past sort of four and a half years? Uh, and to sort of reflect on sort of different models behind the uh, public uh, programs that we organized at the Stadelix. So I have two 
uh, titles for you, uh, how to create a scene, or uh, different models for public programming at the Modern and Contemporary Art Museum. The first one is my favorite, you can choose a more exciting one. Um, and I'm gonna sort of, as I uh, said, talk a bit about sort of the models behind the uh, public program. Um, sort of we've used these models as a way to sort of navigate the different changes that the state look has gone through over the past, I don't know, four or five years, which I'll talk about briefly as well. Um, and sort of to, I guess, to start the story is to start with uh, a definition of what uh, a public program is, because as I also mentioned in my talk, there are many versions of it sort of going around. So I've been visiting a lot of uh, institutions over the past years, and each museum or art uh, uh, institution has its own version of what uh, a public program is, sometimes more uh, education-oriented, uh, sometimes more sort of uh, outreach um, marketing even and sometimes on a more uh, curatorial level. So I'm giving you sort of a, a preliminary definition, um, at least for what the po uh, public program at the Stedelijk is, which is uh, a curated and integrated uh, program encompassing performance, film, media, and discursive programs that together provide a hybrid and critical platform for the discussion and presentation of contemporary art and theory within and beyond the museum's wall. So I hope that's a good starting point for what we're going to talk about this evening. But first, um, some of you may know the Stedelijk, some of you may not or have only uh, heard of it. Um, it's safe to say that it's gone through a bit of a, a transformation over the past uh, 10 years. It closed for a long uh, renovation in 2004, which was uh, slightly overdue because they had been talking about it since the late uh, 80s that they actually wanted to extend the historical building. Hello. Um, and sort of... Um, renovate that as well, and 2004 was finally the year that it was going to happen. The first plans for the reopening that I saw coming by was 2006. Well, we all know that that didn't exactly happen. Um, it turned out to be 2012, and in that sort of interim uh, period, there were several initiatives going on, I guess you can call it that, through which the Stedelijk uh, remained visible and active uh, in the city of Amsterdam. To name a few, there was uh, SMCS, which was an off-site exhibition space next to the central station in Amsterdam. Uh, Stedelijk in the City, which was an educational uh, project throughout the sort of diverse areas in the city of Amsterdam, and then sort of from the time that I started, which was 2010, the uh, temporary Stedelijk at the Stedelijk Museum, um, which I sort of co-founded with uh, Magiet Schavenmaker, who still works at the Stedelijk as a head of research, and of course under the directorship of Anne Goldstein. Um, it's important to emphasize what that moment of sort of uh, temporary state look was. It was a moment that the building of the state look uh, had been uh, closed for six years. There was actually an entire uh, generation, which includes myself really, who had been studying art history in Amsterdam, but really never got the opportunity to see the uh, collection of the state look to uh, sort of experience the building. So to, to be completely or actually to be differently acquainted with the Stedelijk, namely through those off-site uh, initiatives. So it was a moment when everyone who sort of, you know, loved and is inspired by art wanted to go back into that building and to be sort of reacquainted and re-familiarized with that space, but also to have uh, a platform again to, to, the, to discuss and see uh, contemporary art, because quite frankly, uh, that was a bit lacking, uh, because everyone was simply waiting for the state look to reopen. And funnily enough, after the reopening, in the wake of those sort of big institutions sort of awakening again, there were smaller spaces opening, but this had not happened before the reopening, which is odd and something to think about for the future, I guess. So that uh, temporary state look, um, I call it sort of the Kunsthalle model, which is uh, a German model, of course, of an uh, exhibition space without uh, a collection. And of course, the Stedelijk Museum has uh, a collection, but during that uh, temporary Stedelijk moment, we reopened the historical part of the building, which is a sort of late 19th century building, 
and everything was finished, like it looked beautiful, it was nice, everyone came back in. Yet there was one thing quite essentially missing, which was a uh, climate system. And if you want to show those Mondrians and Mayeviches and whatnot, you kind of need that. So we were sort of this temporary space, a uh, Kunsthalle, in between a building and what was one day going to be a um, museum again. And sort of this state of sort of temporality and uh, transiency was really at the core of also what this model uh, consists of. And um, it's a, a Kunsthalle model is usually uh, off-site, but sort of, as I said, the odd thing was that we sort of were almost forced to use this model within our own space, which was also getting to know ourselves in a very sort of different way. Um, and one of the first things that happened at that moment, because you want to reopen that building again, you show exhibitions, you start a major uh, public uh, program, which is what I was sort of assigned to do. The first thing one does is obviously build uh, alliances with other uh, institutions in the city, because I think maybe sort of in previous decades, the state look had operated quite uh, autonomously, and at that point we really needed sort of the partners to sort of awaken ourselves again. Um, sort of the outreach model, if you will, behind that sort of Kunsthalle type of space is um, a model of sort of uh, activation to make people aware that there is sort of a contemporary art uh, platform, in this case in uh, Amsterdam, and to give you an impression of sort of what happened. Um, that the public program at the time started actually, if you compare it with what's happening now, quite as a, as a small thing. It started on Thursday evenings and uh, Friday afternoons with different programs, I guess, for different people as well. So you had uh, performance, uh, film screenings, uh, which was definitely sort of geared towards a more sort of art-oriented uh, audience, and then sort of uh, academic programs such as an evening with or research or like books, so you can see them all on the screen, um, which was actively built in uh, collaboration with the two uh, universities in uh, Amsterdam to ensure that even though you have sort of an art community back into that building, that you also actively seek those uh, alliances with a more academic public. Um, this was the Stedelijk at that point in time, a fabulous installation by uh, Barbara Kruger uh, upon the invitation of Anne. Um, this was the installation that opened during T Emperor Stedelijk I in August 2010. And this is sort of the um, monumental staircase in the historical building. Uh, which was used as an installation. It looks quite different now, actually. Now there's a Flavin uh, installation there, which you may have seen already. It's absolutely gorgeous and completely has sort of transformed the space. So when I saw this photo, it was quite a different thing altogether. Um, as I said, sort of establishing uh, alliances and to make sure that that room, because that was my uh, auditorium at that time, that that room was full with the state look sort of having been off the radar a bit for a few times, one could argue that also the uh, collection of the state look, uh, to a certain extent, had not, uh, is, was not completely sort of in tandem anymore with what was going on sort of in the larger field of uh, contemporary art. So if you look at like uh, media such as performance, digital art, uh, new media art, there were some examples of it in our uh, collection, but it was really time to organize like large scale events around that to not only inform our uh, audiences of what was going on in that respect, but also to have uh, a platform for the institution itself to start actively making uh, acquisitions. Um, this is a performance that we did with uh, Jennifer T around that time. I'm just giving you a few examples just to give you sort of an image of what uh, happened around that time. Um, because one of the things of the temporary state look was that the exhibition that Anne Goldstein uh, curated left a number of exhibition spaces empty, which was by that time a quite a rigorous statement to make because um, if you finally have that building open again and you're making an exhibition, then people kind of expect those exhibition spaces to be full. But Anne really wanted to make a statement with sort of also 
uh, re-inviting people to the building and making them sort of familiar with the space and experience the space as an art space and not just as um, a space with objects in them. So I took that as an opportunity to sort of uh, uh, temporarily occupy the art spaces with a number of uh, performances uh, that took place during those first few months. Uh, Jennifer T. But then, um, as all good things, they must come to an end. So after a bit more than one year in that building, uh, we had to vacate again because um, it was the final stage of the uh, construction. So to give you an idea, sort of the new building was by that time almost finished. The historical building was already there, of course, and they had to sort of attach the two, which was quite sort of a comprehensive thing to do to do and had no place for us anymore. So we had a bit more than one year until our final big uh, historical reopening, if you will. And by that time, it, it was really not an option anymore to do nothing anymore. So um, Anne and I, we sat at the, at the table and like, okay, what are we gonna do next? We're in this sort of temporary mode. It's extremely fast paced, it's flexible. It has a certain uh, energy that gets people back. Um, and we developed a model that was quite straightforwardly and simply called uh, State Look At. And it's the second model that I want to uh, present to you, a nomadic one. Sort of a museum as sort of this parasitic uh, institution, if you will, uh, which is, you know, putting it um, a bit bluntly perhaps, but what it sort of uh, encompassed was the institution that I had reached out to in the beginning of uh, Temporary Stalic, and those were quite a few actually, like 15 till sort of 17. I sort of knocked on their door and said, okay, we have no building, um, and we want to do stuff, and we have ideas, and we got some money as well, of course. Um, can we sort of temporarily organize exhibitions and events at your um, uh, exhibition spaces and venues. And actually, you know, even though one might think that m people may be sort of reluctant to do this, the response was extremely enthusiastic. And people said, of course, come in and, you know, do almost whatever you will in our spaces. So we worked with uh, quite a number, which I'll show you in the beginning. And I believe this to be sort of the most essential period, at least for me, uh, at the Stately, because through sort of those uh, collaborations that you establish with uh, other uh, institutions, you also truly find out what it is that the state look is sort of defined by, um, in the sense that the model that I'm talking was never like, oh, there's a cool art space there, it sort of looks good, let's maybe do something there. No, it always started with uh, a conversation of uh, content, like what are you doing exactly? What have we been doing over the past, well, now 115 years, but also the past five years? And how does that sort of can be attached to each other also to make uh, the people that come there aware that this is actually the state look um, sort of at that location, otherwise it becomes a bit maybe too uh, opportunistic and people won't even notice it. Um, the organizational model behind that is extremely flexible, obviously, like anything you would do in your own house in terms of like security or organization, you have to just put overboard uh, almost and you have to really um, listen and learn from the uh, institution that it works. But if it works, um, you get to share a, a community and actually build something new, which was um, why it was so exciting and so important. So this was uh, a list of uh, the institutions that we worked with. And sort of, uh, of course, you have the uh, Concertgebouw, which is sort of the main uh, concert hall in uh, Amsterdam. Well, of course, you have to look at what they do there, which is, uh, music, obviously, so we had to, uh, we developed uh, projects more uh, oriented towards sound art and more sort of the sonic um, um, elements in our uh, collection as well and to be able to show it there. For example, the iFilm uh, Institute, you don't just organize an uh, exhibition there, but it's based on sort of uh, their uh, uh, film collection and how it uh, overlaps with ours. And so for each institution, there was a completely separate and specific uh, program in that sense, uh, attuned to what they were doing and how we could match that. 
Um, well, the Vondel Park is not really an institution, but I put it in there anyway because it was beautiful. Um, Steve McQueen, uh, Blues Before Sunrise, one of the most beautiful things, I think, to come out of that period. Um, the Vondel Park is sort of the main park in uh, Amsterdam, and what Steve did, quite simply, uh, he changed all the lights in the park from sort of the normal light that you see here to kind of a sort of radiant blue, which um, absolutely transformed the park. Uh, it was cut a bit short because uh, some idiot on a bike actually fell and then sort of the municipality of Amsterdam gets very upset and then you have to stop it. But uh, we got a good uh, uh, two weeks out of it, so that was quite beautiful. Um, this was a, a, a collaboration. Uh, Caesar mentioned uh, the book that we're making out of this, uh, Facing Forward. It was a lecture series of seven major uh, evenings with uh, Ram Koolhaas, uh, Amelia Jones, many uh, others came to uh, Amsterdam to talk through seven different themes about what it means to be sort of speculative in uh, contemporary art. There's been a lot of talk about sort of, um, you know, if you're in a certain time frame, how do you step out of that and sort of, uh, make a vision of what sort of a, a future can be. And we want to not only sort of speculate on what that future could be, like, for example, uh, talking about the city or talking about uh, the medium, or there were sort of uh, seven themes, but also to really question, like, what does it mean to speculate? Um, so there were lecture evenings, you see uh, Rem Kohlhaas and the amazing Sheena Mieville here. If you ever get to the opportunity to, to read a book of uh, Sheena, I would definitely recommend it. It's brilliant. Um, this was the Concertgebouw, so that was the concert hall that I spoke of. Um, we did artist interviews, uh, sound art projects, all kinds of things. Uh, the Rijks Academy, one of the most important uh, residency spaces in Amsterdam, we did mostly artist talks and some book launches there as well, which we thought were important for the artists there at that time. Uh, the Ateliers is the second uh, residency Amsterdam. We organized a series of film exhibitions and film series with actually former uh, residents of the uh, Ateliers because the Ateliers is uh, a residency and sometimes you don't always get to see what happens inside that building. So it was quite important for us to sort of um, open up that space and give uh, people the opportunity to see and meet the artist. Uh, if I Can Dance, I Don't Want to Be Part of Your Revolution, uh, a very long title for a most fabulous institution geared towards uh, the performing arts. We did a number of performance series and the funny thing was uh, If I Can Dance is a uh, is an institution without a space themselves. So that was kind of funny. We were both without spaces. Um, and so we were looking at sort of several uh, vacant spaces in the city, not unlike this one, to just uh, organize our uh, performances there. So two nomads traveling through Amsterdam in a way. Um, this was also with If I Can Dance at the Theater at Fame, a performance by Karen Sitter. And quite sentimentally, in a way, I wanted to end that series um, with Stadelijk at Stadelijk uh, to sort of really make the circle go around, um, so to speak. And it was a week before the big reopening, um, and we organized a series of events um, sort of under our new building, as you could see. Uh, this was during the night, and this is perhaps a better picture. Um, of a dance performance by ICK Amsterdam during the day. Um, and sort of the perfect way to sort of slowly enter your building again. Before I uh, continue with the next one, I guess it's important to emphasize how big the transformation was going from that state look at model where you all over the city working with all those uh, institutions running ar around like a maniac almost and then suddenly sort of you have that building again and everything's open and you can show the collection and there's exhibitions and there's there was a whole new opportunity but also a whole new uh, objective in a way which I'll return to later first um, something that I call the model the model of the radical uh, alternative it's sort of a challenge that we set out for ourselves to work with a space in Amsterdam that is completely different from what we are and what we do. Um, 
as to sort of find on the other side of the spectrum, sort of is it possible to actually work in that way, to work with an institution that you seemingly have nothing in uh, common with, that you know has a completely different audience, has a completely different uh, objective, um, and of course you can do sort of radical. Uh, um, uh, alternative in-house, but to also sort of challenge yourself on a sort of organizational level was, uh, yeah, just the right thing to do um, about that time. There are some uh, questions, of course, um, because you have to make sure that it uh, connects to what you're doing as an art space as well, and to, I don't really like the word, but sort of added value of things like what is sort of the end goal of this, like what do you want to do with this? We worked with uh, Trau Amsterdam, and Trau Amsterdam, for those of you who have been in Amsterdam, is one of Amsterdam's most notorious nightclubs. Um, they are housed in a former uh, print works of the national uh, newspaper called uh, Trau, uh, hence the name. Um, and those spaces, as you can imagine, <coughs> are absolutely amazing. They are huge industrial sort of complexes that is used for like the greatest, you know, nightclub that you can ever imagine, I think. Um, and so I was there quite a bit and looking at those spaces, I thought, okay, we can make this work. We can do something here. Because the, the, the spaces really, I mean, they scream almost for like, it's like these monumental uh, installations that we did there like really found their spot. It's something that you simply cannot do in your uh, own building because A, you don't have the space and you don't have sort of the environment to make that happen. So um, in 2012, there was a series of four, it was mostly events actually at that point in time. So like the only thing that sort of happened for a longer period of time was the uh, Contemporary Art Club, which was an exhibition with uh, Rineke, Matthew, uh, Jeremy, Math, and Mark. Um, and the other was really sort of events also because to really fine tune, okay, what is Trau? I mean, what does it mean for a museum to work in uh, a nightclub and to organize uh, activities there? Obviously, you would have to find the middle ground between uh, club culture and what sort of contemporary art is. Now, of course, there are many instances, certainly in the past, where that has uh, overlapped quite a bit. So for us, it was also looking at which works from our own uh, collection you could sort of position back into maybe sort of the context they uh, originated in. Um, for example, uh, Renika Dijkstra has made a series of works where she made films about people in nightclubs who were like completely on drugs and like going crazy and obviously we had to show that work there because now the people who are that were looking at them so you have this sort of very fascinating mirror uh, effect in a way so that was one of the best examples as well but uh, here it for example was an exhibition which um, showed like the most extreme forms of like sonic art, I would say, which, you know, in uh, a nightclub, you can obviously go all the way. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, collaboration worked actually so well that we decided to do another year in 2013 when we were already open. Um, we decided to sort of continue this uh, model and to organize a series of three exhibitions. The first one, again, sort of around that theme of motion, which of course uh, incorporates dance and is very sort of close to what people do in uh, a nightclub, but then also sort of two other themes which are slightly more random, but with like artists who use such a particular soundtrack and have such a particular way of installing sort of their monumental films that it simply had to be done in, in that space. Um, here are some examples, because I can talk all I want, but you can also see it on the screen here. Uh, Jimmy Roberts' amazing work in the smoking room of Trau. So that's, um, it's, it's amazing that the artist also said yes to certain things. No? It's like you uh, kind of uh, propose a show at the state look, which is then not at the state look, and uh, <laughs> so they have to agree with that, of course, as well. Um, that was uh, Jeremy Shaw's work in the corner, beautiful film about uh, the Vogue dance scene, and uh, work from our uh, 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 collection, uh, uh, Tracy Emmon, called um, This One's For You, where she lists all the people she had uh, sex with in her life, which is quite an extensive list, um, and then sort of 
dances around and like this one's for you. Quite a beautiful and um, yeah, nice work. Um, it also had uh, performances and uh, public interviews that uh, Jimmy Robert and my colleague Bart Rutten from the State Look, um, and of course live DJ performances. Um, and the funny thing was, at the opening nights, you would have the crowd that you would usually see at a Stedelijk opening, but then the exhibition went on for another sort of couple of weeks, and you um, have, you know, people that maybe never come to the Stedelijk, that will never go to the Stedelijk, that suddenly are in the spaces that have these uh, artworks there. And I have to say, the effect was quite amazing. It uh, created this kind of zone that people, you know, went from sort of the dance floor to watching uh, Tracy's work and then being in a completely sort of different mindset. So uh, we did some uh, research as well to ask, like, okay, you've seen these uh, artworks, you obviously like them, would you ever come to the state look? The answer was still no, um, which is fine, really, because it, that wasn't our goal. Uh, but it was like they have a better understanding and a deeper appreciation of like how art could function in their own space, which I think is sort of one of the most uh, beautiful things you can do as a curator. Um, to end this model, uh, we wanted to continue because uh, uh, Trau, and this is getting really specific, um, they're in their final year. After this year, they will stop. They have this sort of five-year uh, periods where they sort of occupy different buildings in the city. And this is the last uh, year in this building. And we had sort of, the state look had done its thing there. We didn't need to make another series of uh, exhibition, but we wanted to do something as almost a, sort of a last uh, homage to that building and to everything we had done there. So we decided to invite three other international institutions who were actually quite close to what we had been doing over the past uh, two or three years there. Of course, uh, Palais de Tokyo from Paris, like one of, uh, it's one of my favorite institutions all over. And um, they, they immediately understood why they were being invited there and what they had to do there. So their exhibition opened two weeks ago with uh, Fouad Bouchoucha, who made uh, an installation and was showing a few of his films there. Um, Beirut from Cairo, ironically. Um, and they're showing Rayan Tabet, which will open in September, which will be really sort of an archaeology of that building. Um, because that building has had a long uh, history and he sort of wants to make that visible. And then the new museum uh, will close the series and trial uh, in November. So I am getting to that moment that I spoke of earlier, namely September 2012. The big reopening of the state look, it has finally happened. The Queen was there. Um, Anne gave a tour of the, you know, it was beautiful, like a week of uh, openings, we were exhausted. But um, for me that was a really funny period because I actually didn't know exactly what to do at that time. I was still in my sort of temporary mode and like wanting to still work in the city because we had only done that for a year and I sort of, you know, didn't want the state look to open almost, which this is being recorded so you have to edit that out. Um, but it opened, and um, suddenly you have to so like, take into consideration that the public program is not only that sort of signaling, autonomously functioning program in the city anymore that, you know, that I could sort of think of almost by myself, but it's now also a program that has to build a, a context for the collection for the Stalex exhibition. So, a whole new model came about actually, which you know I sort of tentatively coined the uh, integrated model, which basically uh, goes to say that um, in addition to maintaining that sort of signaling function, which I think remains essential for what it is, because you have to give artists, young artists and young uh, academics the opportunity to have uh, a platform within a museum that would maybe otherwise only show more established people. You have to maintain that function whilst also building uh, a discursive and performative context for the exhibition program. 
Um, and also to consider a broader range of the publics that you have to tend to, whereas sort of the autonomous public uh, program, if you will, sort of caters to like an expert-oriented audience, whatever that is. The state, like at large, you know, with sort of uh, one million people a year coming by, they're not all experts, but they are interested in art and they want to hear about it. So it's also about making lecture series that are more accessible and sort of cater to that specific audience as well. So these are the new series that are still sort of ongoing. Um, it's it's um, basically you see in sort of the names that some are more sort of theory, so you still have that sort of uh, expert function, performance, etc. And then you have the uh, forum sessions, which are much more sort of wide range and sort of invite various speakers either about the exhibitions or um, about any other topic, really. Um, the collection, well, here's a good example of a collection-related program, the celebration of the John Cage Centennial, which we did in uh, 2012. Um, very beautiful, like, installations all over the building and also, like, showing those works of uh, John Cage that we have in our uh, collection. And also to see, you know, like, a hundred years later, what does John Cage mean for uh, contemporary artists, obviously. Um, research and discursive input. I had to put this photo in because I love her. Lucy um, was there and she made a mark. That's good. Um, research and discursive input. That sort of means that you um, also try to fuel the institution with ideas and uh, information in order to sort of make sure that it sort of never falls asleep again in a way. Um, exhibition related, we had of course a big um, Maevich show last year, which is uh, at this moment opening at the Tate, I think. Um, and we did sort of many exhibition related programs around that exhibition because it was major. But one of the highlights was surely the, not a restaging actually, but a reinterpretation of the famous uh, opera Victory Over the Sun. Um, a Dutch uh, Israeli opera maker, Sharon Minayo, made sort of a completely different version, and we uh, staged it for one week uh, in our auditorium space. So here are some images. Um, and performance and media. This is uh, Alexandra Barsetsis' uh, performance, The Stages of Staging. Uh, it's an artist that I work quite closely with, and um, I'll return to the performance programs in a minute, but this is just one example to give you an idea of how that program uh, can be structured. Because I'm going towards uh, one of the final models I want to present to you, uh, the performance model. It's also like a bit on a personal note, because in the public programs, I slowly grew towards a deeper appreciation and understanding of what performance is and how it functions sort of in the contemporary art landscape. Um, I believe it to be sort of quite at the intersection of sort of many developments that are going on. It's not just functioning as one medium anymore, but if you look at sort of contemporary performance, it's really in between a number of media and also much more sort of flirting in a way with the exhibition format, thus also um, sort of emerging very much interesting questions for the institution, for example, how to acquire uh, performance, which is something sort of we're working through at the moment. So I knew for sure that after the reopening that uh, the performance uh, program was going to take a key role. But not only that, also to figure out, so it was sort of a catharsis kind of thing as well, to figure out how that building works. And because you suddenly have that new building, which has no memory, it has not been activated in any kind of way yet. Whilst on the other side is that historical building, which has, you know, 150 years of memories and people know it and have emotional uh, sort of uh, attachments to it. So like through the uh, commissioning of new performance, often in series actually, I wanted to find not only what is the space for performance in the building, but also what is sort of the more conceptual space of uh, performance within the Stadelix uh, program. Um, well, this is sort of a summary of what I've been saying. So there is one performance series in particular, uh, Stage It. I was sort of 
hung up on these it names at, at that point in time, so you have to forgive me. I'll stop doing that from now on. But nevertheless, it was called Stage It at that point, the first part. Uh, beautiful uh, performance exhibitions and series with uh, Andrea Geyer, MPA, who's currently based in Los Angeles, and of course the amazing Valley Export. Um, I'm just going to show you images because that's the best way. This is the main entrance hall of the Sedelik showing uh, Andrea's performance, uh, Comrades of Time, which is quite an explicitly political uh, performance as well. And I wanted to show it here in the uh, entrance hall because as all sort of modern and contemporary art museums, the entrance hall is this sort of passes by uh, area where you hang your coat and you buy your books and you buy your ticket, etc. But it's actually a very boring space if you look at it and not at all a space for contemporary art, whilst it's the first thing that you see when entering the building. So I really want to uh, sort of uh, create a forum there and there's a beautiful space actually that you can use that for. It's sort of under the Louise Lawler photograph, for those who've been there, there's this completely empty space that is now filled with like lounge couches. So get those couches out of there and start activating those spaces for performance. So that was sort of the goal that we set out for ourselves there. Um, then people walked through the building, sort of the idea was to create this kind of parkour where people would walk through the entire building in groups, sort of from one performance to the other. And along the parkour were um, like six monitors showing uh, Valley Exports, uh, The Power of Language, um, which is a film that is very, very much about sort of the activation of speech, and thus, for me, also the activation of space in that sense. Um, this is MPA, just before the performance started having a Zen moment. Um, I actually wasn't allowed to take f uh, photographs of the performance, so I can just show you this. And we ended with a uh, Valley expert who made uh, a new film actually for this uh, performance. She filmed the um, exterior interior of the um, new and old building of the Stadelijk, whilst it was uh, in the months before the reopening when the uh, collection was installed, just so you could see people, you know, dragging around Willem de Koonings and whatnot. And she wanted to film that process and uh, made that into a sort of seven minute uh, clip. And during the screening, that was sort of the performance uh, aspect of it, she followed the lines and followed everything she, s she saw with like, paint on uh, a canvas. And there's one beautiful moment which I unfortunately didn't get to um, get on a photograph, but it was the moment where you saw sort of a Willem de Kooning installed and then Valley Export like painting over the Willem de Kooning, which is you know kind of a special moment if you think about it. And the parkour ended with the final two screens of the power of language. Uh, stage it part two was a continuation of trying to see, you know, what that space of uh, performance is. Because if you look at the Stadelux uh, architecture, it's quite th sort of theatrical in nature. It has this sort of huge dramatic staircases. It has this sort of the uh, entrance looks like an opera almost. So I was kind of inspired uh, in the second series to think like what exactly, if you look at contemporary performance, is the middle ground between the theater and visual arts performance, which is a much sort of discussed issue at this time. Um, but again, sort of very site specific because at that point I don't think we were ready to make sort of any bigger statements than we were doing ourselves um, at that moment. Um, again, the main entrance, this was uh, Sharon Hayes and uh, Brooke O'Hara. Um, and Brooke O'Hara, who is uh, the life partner of uh, Sharon Hayes, she comes from experimental theater, and this was actually the first work that they made uh, together. And um, Brooke and Sharon sort of made uh, a theater piece, like a proper theater piece, where they sort of left out certain parts of the um, spoken word. So there's actually quite a lot of silences as well, which made people a bit unresty. But the funny thing is, as soon as you announce something as a theater piece, which we did for this uh, particular occasion, people sit down and they don't get up. So even though this was hugely uncomfortable for them, sitting on these like stone staircases, they sat down for like an hour and didn't get up, whilst it was intended for people to really walk around because wherever you were in that enormous space, you could hear it. There were like sound speakers all over the place. 
but apparently the word theater has some sort of magical touch which makes people sit down, um, even in a visual art space. So that was kind of, you know, talking about sort of theatricality and the visual arts, that was uh, an astonishing conclusion in a way. Again, people went down, but now to sit on this staircase and watch the ultra short performance of uh, Pablo uh, Bronstein, which was two minutes long. It was called Girl and Monkey, and that was exactly what it was. One girl was being this sort of fabulous fashion person walking down, and the other one was behaving like a monkey. It was for sort of his uh, ironic take on what theater at the state look could be. People walked up again to go to our auditorium, where um, Dominique Gonzalez Forster um, made an opera, actually. She um, imagined herself as uh, Ludwig II, the famous emperor. And um, Ludwig II, actually, as a historical figure, was interested in the uh, grotto as a kind of way to retreat himself, as this sort of romantic ideal of you know, someone being um, or not in uh, contact with the outside world. Dominique, kind of inspired by that uh, grotto, uh, composed a musical score around that and imagined herself as Ludwig II on the balcony there, sort of the balcony as an element in the theater is obviously quite an important theme. And she wrote the um, lyrical score on the spot. So whilst sort of the music was playing, she uh, wrote the libretto, and this is her in front of the grotto after the performance was done. So that was quite nice. Um, last example of the staged series, it was also the final and last one, because I think we've exhausted that series by now. Um, st staged part three, finally ready to sort of, you know, go beyond the building, because I think we've done that at this point in time, and to look at sort of performance art at large. And one thing, um, you know, in the many sort of artists that I've uh, commissioned to make new work, one thing that struck me the most, if you look at historical performance, let's say of the 1960s and 70s, my impression of it, and sort of uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, that it was largely unscripted. It was more sort of based on materials of uh, improvisation, repetition, et cetera, et cetera. While many sort of young artists, they make a complete script for the uh, performance. Thus, it almost becomes more of uh, a theater piece. And so, if we think also about the acquisition of performance, would the script be something that we could acquire as a way to sort of show the performance endlessly? And what does it mean for sort of the body of the performance, uh, sorry, of, of the performers, the body of the artist? So there are sort of a number of questions that emerge around this script and sort of what its function is in visual arts performance. And I uh, commissioned four artists, um, two duos actually, to make work around that, ranging from really like a completely scripted performance, like like a proper theater piece from something that is completely unscripted and to see how that relates to it. Brendan Fernandez, um, this was again in the entrance hall, just going through the images quickly because I feel I'm running out of time. Uh, Sander Breure and Wit van Huls, actually two Dutch artists who made the theater piece, but then with this you know, enormous installation, which was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Michael Portnoy, uh, doing um, his performance where he built uh, a film set. It's quite an elaborate setup. For a sort of uh, a duration of six hours, he performed 100 uh, beautiful jokes, as uh, he calls them. And for him, jokes are not so much about being funny, but about showing, you know, what other sort of properties a joke can have. Can it be emotional? Can it be disconcerting, can it be like, not like, what is a joke essentially? So he's made over the years this whole lexicon of jokes and references and situations that are usually actually not so funny, but when he performs it, he's such a great actor in a way, they become, you know, extremely funny. So what happened here, uh, six hours, a hundred jokes, he built a film set because he also made a film uh, out of this uh, a performance, there was someone backstage feeding him information from his you know, lexicon of jokes and uh, situations, which he used to make sort of the improvised jokes on stage. So in other words, sort of the, the script was being written 
as you know, he spoke in a way with the information that he has written down himself. So quite a complex interplay of joke and uh, sorry of script and staging in that way. Well, this is Michael in full throttle, as you can see, um, and uh, the other um, performance of. Pilingalia, I didn't have the pictures of yet because our photographer is slow. Um, other models, I want to just you know present to you some other things that we have not necessarily used. I mentioned in the beginning, of course, a public program can also be based on uh, education, which is a separate department at the state look. Um, so with also kind of a different objective in a way, it's definitely more towards sort of a family-oriented uh, audience and also with a more sort of educational approach, obviously, which is something that I do not necessarily think um, I'm doing with the public program. Uh, the outreach model, like, you know, you make uh, programs for a specific audience and you start with that question, like, you know, what is the public that we want to reach with this? It's never an approach that I felt very comfortable with because it has to start with sort of a content discussion in a way and then you could see, okay, you know, which people might, you know, possibly be interested in this. There is one thing I wanted to end with. I haven't... Um, worked it into my uh, presentation because I've been thinking quite a bit like, you know, we've had all these models, we've had those years going in and outside of the building still actually. Um, what would be the next phase? You know, what would 2015 look like? We have a new director, obviously, who surely has an uh, opinion about this, but um, also for me, sort of, I think each two years or each year maybe even, sort of the public program should sort of try out a new model. And there's one text that I've recently read which I found incredibly inspiring and would like to sort of advise everyone to read. It's published last month on EFLUX uh, Journal, a text by Chus um, Martinez. It's called The Octopus in Love. And it's about, actually the octopus has a brain in each part of its body, which is, I didn't know that. And so each part of its body functions sort of uh, autonomously, but also uh, together. And she sort of connects that to the way that institutions are built with sort of their different departments. But also in a way, if you look at a museum such as this Tatelik, it has many sort of discipline that it uh, houses as well from like, um, painting, sculpture, performance. Uh, these are all sort of disciplinary spaces within one building. And to imagine a space where maybe the discipline of something is not so important as that's something that I'm working through it. Like, can we imagine the museum as this kind of non-disciplinary space where, you know, it's basically in between a theater, a museum, an art institution, a, a nomadic space, everything in one. I think it should maybe come at some point to some kind of apotheosis, but I'm not there yet. So um, perhaps we can um, take some questions. And it's uh, a text, as I said, that I want you to read. And you know, if you have any advice for me, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to take it. Thank you for listening, first of all. The question for those who didn't hear it was about sort of that differentiation between education and public program, which um, is maybe not so extreme here. It's maybe started out a bit extreme because I wanted it to be. Um, it's also a process of uh, emancipation, like you're building for the first time uh, a public program. So you start with, of course, screaming, we're not education. Um, and but it's, there's also more to it than that because uh, the education department at the museum, or at least at a lot of museums in Western Europe, um, it's, a different, it's a different language almost that you speak. It's, it's, um, it's almost always about making art accessible and it's almost always about sort of uh, creating a space where people can sort of comfortably be acquainted with art. I'm being a bit sort of too straightforward now. Um, and I guess sort of the public program does not have that sort of pedagogical uh, approach. It's more about 
uh, creating a platform within the state like that sort of any kind of discussion, however complicated or unaccessible, can take place, even for a very small uh, crowd. And sort of the education department is quite geared towards, you know, there has to be a big crowd for something. Um, so that sort of non-pedagogical approach and that, you know, just simply the fact that I don't have to teach anyone anything is sort of one of the biggest differences that I saw in the beginning. However, um, now that sort of we're two years on the road in the new building, the performance is starting again. Um, now that we have two years in the new building, there is a middle ground, I feel. Like sort of we've always been in sort of, you know, good terms, uh, obviously, but now we're actually talking, sort of the two sort of departments are talking to each other about developing programs of the things that lie in the middle of what we do. This, whereas sort of the public programs are, you know, really more for an expert uh, audience and what they're doing is more for like families and kids. There is a huge group in the middle Namely, again, sort of that person that is interested in art but has, you know, no real attachment to, you know, go to a lecture or talk or anything. That is actually exactly in the middle, at least at the state look, of what education and public uh, program does. So there is a conversation going. Yeah, um, there's a team of about. 12 curators at the state look, more or less. Um, three design curators, a uh, number of collection curators, and then sort of contemporary art uh, curators who make exhibitions. Um, and then there's myself, of course. Um, the conversation is very good, I have to say. Like, there are sort of um, uh, weekly meetings. I mean, it's, it's, it really comes down to that, obviously. There's weekly meetings where everyone comes uh, together to not only discuss, like, you know, okay, what is the direction of certain things that we want to take in the coming years. It's also uh, a conversation, obviously, with the director, but, um, and also, like, what is everyone working on? And more specifically, um, the autonomous part of sort of the public program, I would sort of discuss in those meetings as to, you know, make everyone aware of sort of the direction of that is taking, but, you know, definitely taking the lead in that. Whereas if I uh, uh, curate an exhibition related uh, program, that always starts with a conversation with that exhibition curator. So it's not like, oh, I hear that there's a Marlene Dumas show coming. I have you know, these ideas. No, it's really talking about what is this show going to be about? What is already going to be in the show? What kind of work? What is sort of the narrative in the show? And really trying to build sort of a context around that. So that dialogue is, needs to be there and thankfully is there as well. Um, so the question was about funding um, and sort of in which stage, I guess, you sort of define your ambition for a program and then sort of link that to how to realize it. Um, the public program of the state look is funded by the general subsidy that we get from the city of uh, Amsterdam uh, because we're a city funded uh, institution. So uh, per year I get to spend an amount of 175,000 uh, euros. Um, that is you know, not enough for what I want to do. So you build sort of a core uh, program of in like, you know, the performance programs, the media programs, everything. That's sort of, you know, what you get to spend. Uh, the exhibition related programs are uh, funded by the exhibition budgets. So those are added to it in a way. And there's a lot of fundraising when uh, it comes to like the performance programs in particular because those are usually the most expensive. And those can either be at funding bodies or through other embassies of an artist, of course, when she or he is from a country that has a strong uh, funding uh, presence as well. So it's... Currently, it's not so structural. It's kind of improvised, you know, d depending on the artists that we work with. Um, but there are ideas on the table to make it more sort of structural. There are new funds that are being set up at the moment, which, you know, part of the program will be funded by. It's sort of a parallel uh, trajectory still and sort of a parallel plane even in, in, in a way. 
but it's something that we're working towards. But um, yeah, so mainly it's being funded by the city of Amsterdam. Quite, I, I hope that answers your question, also the scope of it. But no, yeah, every day. <laughs> um, it's this question was about how I, um, what sort of the liaison is, if you will, between the uh, communication department and the public program uh, department. Um, I write all the text myself um, because it's also that is the platform through which I uh, communicate a lot of the things, uh, obviously. And um, the texts are then sort of being edited for different uh, channels by the uh, communication department, but always with a final check uh, of me. So. Anything that goes out, I, I would like to see, but it's sort of a constant dialogue, and there are great people there, so it's very easy to, to talk to. And um, they also like, they, they like appreciate the program for what it is in a way, you know, as, as, as a way to get a certain uh, audience in. Of course, they have their own way of thinking of what that program should do and look uh, how it works, and they think more in like, target groups and that kind of thing, but it provides that, even though I come from a very different approach and sort of uh, perspective. So the communication, certainly on sort of social media has, has expanded quite a bit over the past few years. Um, also sort of with a lot of the performance artists that I work with are increasingly interested in making like trailers and short clips. They, I mean, they're doing all kinds of things which our PR department is like thrilled <laughs> to put out there in the world. So yes, that's uh, a very important part of, of my job actually to make sure that the right channels are used to uh, sort of communicate what we do and to convey that. If I had to summarize it, um, I guess sort of the model of integrated uh, practice comes comes closest to to what we do, and to sort of tap into those two sort of lines or two modes that you sort of discuss. I guess um, a museum such as the State League really has to do both because it has that sort of major uh, collection that it's that it's sh showing to the people every day that it needs to maintain. But you know, if it wants to sort of stay in focus, it needs to obviously and wants to engage with a contemporary artist. And I guess sort of that's, you know, that that's also a new sort of area for the uh, public uh, programs of many museums to explore. That contemporary artists are not working exclusively in exhibition formats anymore. This seems pretty obvious. But you know, it is it is sort of a case in point, and um, so also through discursive uh, practice, media practice, there needs to be a, a platform for that within the institution. That's maybe that's the summary. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Hendrik, and thank you all for joining us.